Good, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, my name is Gay Min Yi. I'm the uh, technical director of the I4 Energy Center. Um, along with uh, my colleague, co-director Gary Baldwin, I like, uh, who unfortunately is not here today, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, today's uh, I4 Energy Seminar. I uh, also want to welcome those that are viewing uh, the seminar online. Um, I've been asked to make a couple of uh, announcements. Uh, I think I'm going to have to get my glasses. I can't read this. Hold on. Okay, on April 6th, uh, from 1 to 3 p.m., there is an academic panel for the uh, carbon roadmap. It's a uh, energy effic efficiency for buildings and green electronics. Um, that panel discussion is part of a Sing Hua week uh, in Berkeley. Um, Sing Hua University is located in Beijing, and next week they have a delegation of 130 faculty, administrators, staff, and students that are going to be here in Berkeley. Um, second announcement is there is a Green Tech Entrepreneurship Academy from June 28th through July 2nd. Uh, at Lake Tahoe, there are flyers at the back of, uh, back of the room. Um, this is a one-week green technology entrepreneurship academy. It's open to science and engineering seniors, um, graduate students, and postdoctorate researchers and faculty working on research in green technologies. The academy combines uh, seminars and networking sessions in an innovative format to help you learn how to commercialize your technology uh, accepted applicants receive fellowships to cover room and board, tuition, uh, open to applicants from national and international universities, apply online by May 14th. Okay, uh, everyone's been hearing about the smart grid these days, and um, most of the time it's about technology, you know, the smart meters, Zigbee, uh, smart appliances, uh, uh, solar energy, wind power, um, uh, plug-in hybrids and storage and so on. But the few have been thinking, but a few have been thinking and talking about the implications of all this smart grid stuff on privacy and security. And today's speaker, Deidre Mulligan, is one of those people. Uh, professor Mulligan is a, an assistant professor with the School of Information here in Berkeley. Uh, previously, she was at the School of Law, where she was a clinical professor of law and director of the Samuelson Law, Technology, and Public Policy Clinic. Uh, prior to coming to Berkeley, she served as staff counsel at the Center for Democracy and Technology in Washington, D.C. Uh, professor Mulligan received a B.A. from Smith College and a J.D. from Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, her current research agenda focuses on information technology, privacy, and security. Uh, let's welcome uh, Professor Mulligan. I think I'm live. All right. Thank you very much, Gaiman. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and at the outset, I wanted to thank. Uh, Gaiman and his colleagues for providing funding for this research. Um, initially, I ended up working, uh, doing a report with David Wagner in um, computer science uh, and uh, an external consultant um, looking at privacy and security issues and demand response energy architectures, I want to say five years ago now, four years ago? Three, they say it's only three. It feels like forever ago. And at the time, nobody knew what I was talking about, right? Uh, if I went to talk to lawyers, they just looked at me blankly. Um, California was ahead of the curve, both with respect to the technology, but I think also in thinking about what sorts of information and research one might want to generate in order to make good use of this technology. And so I want to kind of give California some credit for that. Um, so I just want to give an overview. I'm going to talk about why privacy is an important issue in smart grids and to think about it as kind of a requirement. 
want to think about the sorts of new risks to privacy that are generated. And I'm not going to talk much about security, but I'll, I'll touch on it briefly in a few places. I want to talk about innovation risks and how they relate to regulatory policy. Um, and then I want to look at how law and policy and technology together might provide some solutions. Um, so smart grid privacy risks. Um, it's a very famous Supreme Court case, uh, Kylo v. the United States, which involves law enforcement officials, police sitting in a car outside somebody's house and pointing a thermal imaging device um, at the building. And anybody know what they were trying to find out? How many grow lights there were, right? They were trying to basically figure out whether or not somebody was engaged in marijuana production in the home. Um, and they use this thermal imaging device without going to the court to get a warrant. Now, generally, when we think about um, intrusions on privacy expectations, the government, if they want to come and search your house, they want to seize information in your house, they have to go to a court and get prior approval. They have to specify what it is that they're going to take and what the crime is and why it's important. And so we have this procedural mechanism as well as, as a substantive bar that they have to um, meet in order to get access to information. Well, the law enforcement officials basically said, well, we didn't go into the house, right? What we did was we used this device to basically figure out how much energy was being consumed. And from that, we could make some um, decisions about whether or not we wanted to commence an investigation here or further our investigation. Now, um, engineers always have a really fun time reading the oral argument in this case because there's a rather interesting conversation about whether or not the energy leaking out of the home is coming through the walls or bouncing off the walls. And so really, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a kind of exercise in how courts deal with advancements in technology and existing legal doctrine, it's a really fun case to read. So I didn't, I'd uh, commend it all to you. But at the end of the day, what the Supreme Court says is you're using this technology that isn't in general public use, and you are learning intimate details about activities happening in the home, and you're, lear you're learning more than you're actually seeking to learn, right? So there's, there's some other cases where, for example, if I want to test a substance to figure out whether it's cocaine or not, if the only thing my test reveals is cocaine or no cocaine, that will be deemed not to be a search. If it revealed something else about the white powder, it might be deemed to be a search. But because it's a perfectly tailored technology that reveals only the illegal activity, it's deemed not to be a search. So here, thermal imaging device, um, Justice Scalia basically says, you know, we could be revealing the details of the lady taking her sauna or her bath, right? So this technology is found to be overly inclusive. It's revealing details in the place that we think of as most highly protected, right, the, the home. Um, and therefore, even though law enforcement officials didn't have to trespass on the home, they nonetheless needed to get a warrant to use that technology to figure out the information, the energy consumption that was going on in the home. Now, you could say, well, they could have watched the snow melt and right, deduced the same sort of information. But the court didn't care, right? They said, you're using a technology. It's not in general public use. You're pointing it at the home. It's overly inclusive. You're going to get lots of information beyond things that are purely illegal. And therefore, you need to come and get a warrant. So thinking about um, why does this relate to the smart grid? Well, uh, of course, that same information about energy consumption is collected by utilities every day, right? All the utilities across the country have information about the energy consumption. Historically, it's been these one-month readings, right? Or if your meter is in your house, perhaps every three months when they actually could get in to do an actual reading. That information, under federal law, because it is considered to be a third-party record, right? So as an individual, you've made a decision to disclose information to a third party. Uh, a really easy example would be when I send a letter to somebody, I have some protections against interception when I send that letter, right? The Fourth Amendment protects the privacy around that letter even when it leaves my hands and goes through the mail. But once Gaiman receives it, 
he's free to do whatever he wants with it, right? He can turn it over to law enforcement because now that information is also his. So the thinking is, under this business records doctrine exception to the Fourth Amendment, um, an entity that has your information, your bank, uh, your health care provider, anybody, that information, once it's in their hands, is considered a business record. It's considered something that you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy under the Fourth Amendment to the federal constitution, right? And therefore, if law enforcement wants access to that, to the extent that there are protections, they're going to be statutory or they're going to come at the state level. At the state level, there are some limitations that govern uh, when utilities disclose information to law enforcement or to other private parties. But those limitations ar arose in an environment where that information wasn't particularly revealing, right? So none of them require a warrant. Some of them may allow utilities to disclose for any purpose whatsoever to law enforcement without any sort of process. Sometimes there may be an administrative subpoena or some lower level of process, but it's not this full-blown go to a court and get a, a warrant in order to access this information. So with the smart grid, we now have the equivalent, right? We have data, 15-minute increment bits of data um, about energy consumption in the home, not monthly increments. And potentially, we have real-time um, readings being possible, right, from a remote location. This begins to look a lot like somebody standing outside your home with a thermal imaging device, right? Yet the legal protections may be completely distinct. So I'm going to talk in the rest of this uh, presentation about law enforcement access, but also about criminals, utilities, and other third parties. OK, so we have this environment. All of a sudden, we have information flowing in and out of the home. We're particularly concerned about the information flowing out of the home in these very um, uh, small increments. right? It could be in 15-minute intervals. It could be in real time. What sorts of protections? Well, we have federal, state. Uh, there, at both levels, there are broad anti-wiretapping laws, right, which basically prevent interception of that information when it's in transit. Um, we also have computer fraud and abuse laws at both the federal and state level, which prevent unauthorized access to data. What does it mean to access data uh, beyond authorization? A lot of it will depend upon the terms of use and, and your authority with respect to that provider. It's not a statutorily defined term. It's left to the service, basically, to define. Um, law enforcement access, I talked about federal Fourth Amendment. Um, it is possible, right, that because if the Supreme Court were to look at a case where law enforcement had gone and gotten access to demand response energy or smart grid energy consumption data from a utility, basically sitting there doing, if you ever watch The Sopranos, you know, they'd get on the phone and they'd listen for 30 seconds and decide whether or not it was a call that they should be wiretapping and then hang up. Well, imagine sitting there basically looking at energy feeds data in real time, not requiring a warrant. And I think it's possible that a, a court might look at that under existing Fourth Amendment jurisprudence and say, this data looks just like the data in Kylo. And therefore, we actually need a warrant, even though this data is in the possession of a third party. But it's very unclear. Um, at the state level, we have. Uh, certainly state constitutions, some of which don't uh, take a much narrower view of the third party doctrine. So there are a number of states where utility records have been found to warrant some level of constitutional privacy protection, although none of them have um, applied a warrant requirement, right? They've said there's something less than probable cause required to get access to this information. There are also state statutes that provide some protection. Um, pr principally aimed at utilities, public utilities in many instances, um, investor-owned utilities. And in California, for example, the Public Utility Commission rules require warrant or subpoena for access to customer information, um, although there are some qualifications to that. Um, the utilities are also, in the existing environment, governed by regs that limit um, the disclosure of consumer, customer information to third parties, right? So they can disclose aggregate data, but they can't be disclosing information that's personally identifiable about your energy consumption willy-nilly, right? That's not allowed. Um, 
Then we have third parties, which are being introduced into this smart grid, right? So you can think about Google Home or Microsoft, not Home, what's the name? Um, they're competing product. There are lots of device players entering the market. And these folks, um, there may be some regulations that are limited to specific service providers, but for the most part, they're not regulated, right? The, their access to energy consumption data, to the extent there are going to be any constraints on it, are going to come out of um, either contracts between customers and those products or between the utilities and those products if the information is flowing from the utility. Um, civil litigants are also uh, an issue that is, is not addressed currently. Right? So um, we know many of you probably use fast track to go over the bridge, and you may or may not know they're collecting data about how many times you go across the bridge. And those sorts of um, inf data points are very, very valuable pieces of information to a whole host of players in different sorts of proceedings. You think your wife is cheating on you. Well, how many times is she going across the bridge, right? And so service providers who store information, whether it's true, right? Whether it's, you know, it's, it's um, toll data or it's um, Google or Microsoft or Yahoo who have all this account information about what you do online, right? All of those things have proven to be very attractive for litigants in civil cases. So I highlighted some of the problems with the existing privacy rules, right? Different rules apply to different entities, utilities versus third parties. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty even under the existing rules for covered entities, right? So um, investor-owned utilities, when we say that you can't disclose customer information without customer consent, are all of the smart meter traces included in that customer information, right? Customer information is a term of art in some of these statutes, and it's unclear whether it's robust enough, as it's currently defined, to cover all the pieces of data that one might have, some of which I'll talk about in a second. Um, incredibly important issues for law enforcement access. I don't mean to be completely uh, over the top, but many of you are probably familiar with the case against um, AT&T and around... Um, their decision to allow the NSA to go in and establish a separate room and basically to pipe all of the transactional data about telephone conversations um, going on in the U.S. into a secret room for analyzing. Are you familiar with that? Okay. There, at least in my opinion, they were violating clearly established federal law, right, when they did that. Now, they got some immunity after the effect. But you know what? They could very easily pipe all of the energy consumption, all the smart grid data into a little room, and I can tell you there's no, gonna, there's no legal violation. Right? So if you want to think about like doomsday privacy scenarios, there's one for you to think about. Um, the rules that exist today, in addition to not addressing the new entries and the new data flows that are coming on, into this new market, um, they also follow this notice and consent model generally. Right? So if I say it's okay for my utility to disclose my information, that's basically all I get to say. There are no limitations on how that data is handled after I've made a decision to further disclose it. So there's no use limitations. There's no security rules. There's nothing, right? There may be some stuff in um, developments coming out of the Federal Trade Commission around security obligations more generally for entities that handle personal information. But at this time, there's no clearly defined rules. So I mentioned, you know, in analog meter data flow, we have one data point a month. The data flows directly to the utility. The confidentiality is protected by federal and state law and utility policies. Right? I talked about it being protected on the wire. It's protected in your home by the Fourth Amendment. It's protected on the wire by laws about interception. It's protected at the utility by laws that protect against um, unauthorized access to information over networks. Um, when we introduce some of the smart meter data flows, all of a sudden, right, a 15-minute reading, if that's the interval we're using, that's 3,000 data points a month, right, as opposed to one. Um, it might flow to the utility. It might flow to a utility from, uh, sorry, for, to a third party from the utility, right? Microsoft is set up right now where um, they get a consent, I believe. Um, it might flow directly to a third party, right? Some of them are being set up that way. Um, and so the existing rules, again, address that disclosure, but not any of the subsequent use of that information or any of the issues around law enforcement access or civil litigant access to that data. Um, 
This is an experiment that I participated in, but primarily as the lawyer on the project, not as the person who was actually crunching the numbers. So be kind to me if you ask questions. Um, but we collected meter data from a student residence at 15 second intervals. We combined it with information about the appliances. We tuned this behavior extraction algorithm on the training data set and then applied it to an experimental set. Um, basically, and then we looked at some activity logs to try to figure out whether or not we could accurately profile and predict certain sorts of activities and patterns from the data. And the result was, you know, sleep presence intervals determined correctly nearly all of the time. You could look at the microwave use. Um, some, there was some other kind of energy and environmental data that would be likely to improve the performance of this, right, if you know a little bit more about what's going on in the home. Um, but today, that, that's what we could do without knowing a whole lot um, about the appliances. And right now, we have very device-specific information flows. Um, so what I mean by that, right, some of the Han protocols actually require devices to be registered with the utility. Right? So if you think about um, your home, wireless, your wireless network in your home, um, when I come in and I want to put a new device on my network, I don't register my device with AT&T. Right? That's not what I do. I'm allowed to connect whatever device I want to my network because it's my network. Um, some of these protocols actually are set up so that you have to register your device with the utility in order to allow that device to talk to your home area network, right? This is the network within the home that's going to help you manage your energy consumption. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the innovation concerns there. Um, but it's also a privacy issue in that we don't have to try to figure out which devices are which because the devices have been registered. Right? I now know exactly what devices people have in their homes, and I can see when they're on and off. And I can, right now, one can imagine that there are some potential benefits to this. Right? It may help me give information to people who have appliances that are malfunctioning and producing over, you know, more load than they should, or people who are not making wise use of the appliances they have, or really we want to give them a big rebate so they upgrade. Um, but one can also imagine that this creates additional privacy concerns. What hot, um, well, it's the home area network. So um, within the home, the idea is, right, there's a network and a gateway. Um, the Han, I'm going to talk about this a little bit in another slide, but in some instances, like in California, the Han is actually envisioned to be part of the meter, right? And so that home area network is the network that you use within your home to control energy consumption, right? It could come with some very nice consumer interface that allowed you to respond to demand, res demand response energy signals or to configure when your appliances go on and off because of what you know about load pricing, right? And then that meets up with a gateway, right, which could be the same device or it could be two separate devices, depends. Um, and that gateway provides the connection between the home area network and the utilities network. Was that good enough? Ron, do you want to add anything? I thought you did a great job. Okay. Um, anybody else have any questions about? Um, I think it's pretty pointed out that ponds and home area networks all security around that. All that is still open to discussion. Yes. There's no standards on that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, given that I have 30 minutes, you know, there's ongoing work um, at NIST and at FERC looking at the security issues most specifically, but also looking at privacy issues. Um, and I'm happy to talk with people more about that. Um, so there are some uh, other alternatives. Um, uh, to, there are some alternatives to the Han, and one is, is OpenADR, which was developed by LBNL. Um, and it allows customer control over devices, and it does not monitor, measure, or collect any customer device or other data from customer sites. This is something that Ron and Gaiman can probably talk to you much more about, but just important to note that right now there is a push to use this Han mechanism for dealing with um, the home area network, and there's also in some jurisdictions a push to have that Han actually be part and parcel of the meter. And 
Just because that's the direction people are going right now, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the only direction. And there are some potential privacy and perhaps innovation benefits to thinking about alternative architectures. Um, so I wanted to talk about fair information practice principles. Um, these are a set of principles that were developed in the 1970s. Some people consider them to be very dated. They came about at the era of the mainframe um, database. There are a lot of concerns about kind of due process with respect to data collection, um, wanting people not to be treated like a widget, right? So if you're collecting information about people, you have to have a purpose for collecting it. You should minimize the data you collect. You should only use the data for the purpose that is understood from the consumer side, right? Um, you should maintain the quality and the integrity of the data, protect the security, and you should be accountable for those practices. Why do I talk about these? Well, as a, a general matter, these are the principles that underlie most of the data protection and privacy protective statutes that we have, both domestically at the federal and state level and internationally. And so when you hear people talk about privacy rules, these are the kind of general things that they're talking about that they want to see embedded in the smart grid. Um, so some of the unresolved privacy issues is a bit of a regulatory vacuum. So I mentioned the Public Utilities Commission. Um, now, they have authority over investor-owned utilities. And they can certainly look at whether or not there's a need. And they are looking, right? There's an ongoing proceeding right now can look at whether or not we need to update the rules because the sensitivity of the data, the granularity of the data has changed. The amount of data they're getting, they're getting new pieces of information, potentially such as device registration information. Um, however, they don't have direct jurisdiction over third parties, right? So to the extent that there's a decision to disclose, a consumer makes a decision to use some sort of device or service to help them manage, for example, their home area network, the Utility Commission doesn't have jurisdiction over them. Um, it certainly doesn't have jurisdiction over uh, other players that might end up having um, energy consumption data in this new environment. Um, and so dealing with law enforcement issues, um, other, other utilities, right, other than investor-owned utilities, um, and dealing with the third-party rules might require separate proceedings. So while the PUC has jumped in, um, it's unclear that they really can do this job by themselves and thinking about how we have some kind of consistent privacy protections for the data, regardless of who holds it. Um, there is a law that's been, a bill that's been proposed, SB 837, which I don't have time to talk about, but it would address some of these gaps. Um, I'm going to move forward. Um, so I mentioned there's this placement of the Han Gateway. It's a relatively critical design decision, whether it's on the meter or off the meter. Um, and it's not as, so if we think about the meters generally, right, are um, uh, provided by the utilities to customers, right? It's, you don't usually go out and buy your own meter, right? So they own the device. Um, and the question about just because you own the device doesn't necessarily mean that the data that is in the device is yours, right? But there's some um, potential benefits for thinking about splitting this issue of the, the Han gateway and the meter. Um, on the privacy side, it might encourage information flow to the utility and to third parties, right, if it's on the meter, right, because now there's more of an assumption that that data should go as opposed to having some barrier there between those two um, devices or software, right. Um, and at an innovation level, there's a concern that this is going to allow utilities to approve or reject in-home technologies, right, making decisions um, in a kind of... Uh, not necessarily highly, highly um, regulated or agreed upon model, right? So if we have this device registration model, it suggests that a utility might tell you you can't have certain devices talk to your network, right? And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about where that might come from and why we might be concerned about that. Um, and so that's some of the innovation risks too. So this is the slide I wanted to get to next. Um, in the 1960s and, and going back before that, right, AT&T had argued the need for absolute control over devices um, to protect its network. 
right? So you had to have a specific phone, right? You couldn't just go out and attach any device. You couldn't attach a personal computer to the phone line, right? And they said, because we want it, we're responsible for this network. It's a high reliability resource. We need to make sure it's up, right? We want to have absolute control. Um, however, they were, so, and the net neutrality debate, which many of you may be familiar with, that's going on still in DC at the Federal <coughs> Communications Commission and in Congress, um, you know, questions about whether or not there are, um, there's flexibility for your ISP to make decisions and to treat different sorts of traffic generated by different sorts of programs differently, right? Um, and what sorts of limitations there might be on that. So there have been some policy re re resolutions in the telecom space, right? So there's a Carter phone decision from many years ago um, that basically requires allowing devices, if privately beneficial and not publicly detrimental, right? So what happened was we ended up with a standard which is about interoperability and non-interference, right? So that's why you can get whatever phone you want, right? You, you're allowed to attach devices to the network as long as they're beneficial to you and um, they're not publicly detrimental, right? They don't make the system crash, et cetera. So we have a similar issue here that's going to be going on in the context of the smart grid, right? Utilities are very concerned about the security of their network and the reliability of their network. We're now saying we want to have consumers' homes having two-way communication, right? This isn't just about them pushing information down to the home. This is also about information coming up from the home, which also means we have potentially like the best denial of service attack ever, right? All these homes are networked. If you think about meters, they don't tend to be highly physically secure devices, right? They are often on the outside of people's houses. Not a lot of physical security, not a lot of software security. Right? And so if you think about this, you can imagine as we're connecting different sorts of devices to the home area network, which is then through this gateway going to be talking to the utilities network, that they have some legitimate concerns about the security risks that that might introduce to the network. You can also imagine, as happened recently right in the whole kind of net neutrality debate, that sometimes people wanting to engage in reasonable network management um, are using that as a cover for engaging in anti-competitive practices, right? And so, you know, why is it that you might not want to let Skype traffic successfully go over your network? Well, it could be that you think there's a real security problem, or it could be that you don't want it competing with your current long-distance offering, right? And so thinking about how we deal with realistic, legitimate security concerns about the home area network's connection through this gateway to the utilities network is a very important issue. But it's also one that I don't think we want to ship off completely so that utilities are kind of free to make decisions about device use in the home, right? Because that potentially provides more flexibility than is necessary to support security. Um, Let's see. So there are some opportunities, right? There's been some proposals, a peer pilot project that targeted small businesses, found a 20% peak load reduction on event days with just one-way communication from the utility, right? The security issues tend to really be in that two-way communication. So some people have suggested that maybe looking at one-way communication so that I can use the information and I can alter my behavior, but there's no data flowing back about how I'm responding to those signals. Um, there are potential innovation advantages there. Um, it takes utilities mostly out of the kind of uh, energy management side um, and allows for some more uh, flexibility of who's going to play in that space. And it certainly d would do away with this kind of device registration or approval process because it wouldn't have the same security concerns. There might be some privacy advantages, right, as you see up here. Um, and with that, I'm going to open it up two questions, because I think I went over time. Thank you. Thank you, Deidre. Uh, we'll have, uh, anyone have questions uh, for, for Professor Mulligan? Oh, Carl. Carl Brown, CIEE. So the, the customer has uh, unfettered access to uh, virtually limitless amount of, of energy, 
um, with no, uh, no restrictions there. And um, that energy is, uh, and that whole access to that is, public, is done by a publicly subsidized uh, enormous infrastructure. Uh, it didn't just pop out of the ether. And there's also potential for, uh, you know, ab abusing that, that access to cause harm, either in aggregate to the environment or maybe even locally to your, your neighbors blowing out a transformer or something like that. So all those things seem to me to be uh, to take the, the electricity use out of the, outside, out of the home have a characteristic out of the home, does that affect the, the thinking here? Yeah, so I, one thing I want to be really clear about is, I mean, um, there are areas where um, privacy is going to be in direct competition with other social values, right? And in those instances, I think one needs to have a public conversation about what the trade-offs look like. And I think what you're saying is that, you know, there may be some energy rationing that's necessary, right? We want to be able to cut people off who are hogging all the, right? And in order to do that, we might need some data about who's consuming what. I, I'm not going to tell you yes or no. I'm going to tell you that that's a public conversation that should happen, right? My goal here is to kind of say, here are the existing privacy rules. Here's the way in which there are new players entering the marketplace and new information flows and new granularity on existing information flows. And here are some of the implications for the laws that we have. We've made a public policy commitment, right, manifest in the California state constitution, federal law, utility regs, to have a certain level of privacy protection. We've said energy consumption data merits privacy protection. If you want to keep to that tune, there are things you need to do because there are these new players and these new information flows. I think it's a perfectly legitimate question to say, you know what, energy is a public good, which I think is what you're saying. Um, and if we want to manage this as a collective public good, we need to think about strategies to do that. And some of that's going to require data about individual activities, right? And you can think about public health, right? We understand that the fact that you don't vaccinate your kids or, you know, you're walking around with some infectious disease has an impact on other people. And so we have mechanisms that we use to try to manage your rights with the impact you might have on everybody else, right? And those are conversations that I think are really important to have. And I think energy is, is one of those areas where I think we're moving towards having that sort of conversation. What I would suggest, though, is that before you have that conversation, I think a, a better conversation to have is whether or not you can harmonize those interests. I think a lot of load forecasting, a lot of energy control can be done with less granular data can be done on the client side, right? So we could find out, we could still um, be doing a lot of intense data management in the home, but have much less information, still relevant information for your purposes, such as are you using more than your fair share flowing out of the home, but not the detailed profile about which one of my appliances is using the data, right? And so I think that there's lots of issues around can we get some of the advantages we want in managing this public resource through aggregate data flows? Can we get it through using signals that go downstream rather than sucking data upstream? I think there's a lot of those sorts of conversations that we need to have. And I think there are not just privacy issues, there's also security issues. Ron Hoffman from uh, CIEE. Um, in homes, there are now multiple networks. We have entertainment networks, we have IT networks, people are talking about health networks. Could you comment on how we can have uh, sort of one conversation about all the privacy and security issues and not have four or five or six and reinvent the wheel over and over again? Yeah. Um, so part of that conversation, I think, is actually happening. Um, and I'd say one of the things about the networks is we have more and more networks in the home and less and less data in the home, right, because everybody's outsourcing. My mail is with Hotmail or Gmail, and my documents are with Google Docs, and my data is at some remote processing. And so the network's in the home, but the data's not, right? And so some of the updating that has to happen is um, there was a federal law passed in 1986 which provides our baseline federal protect privacy protections for electronic communications um, and remotely stored data. And that law is woefully out of date. 
it makes um, distinctions that you would just find baffling because it's very tied to the technology that existed at the time. I'll give you one specific example. It makes a distinction around the level of privacy protection you have for your email based on how long it's been sitting on somebody's server and whether or not you've opened it. Okay, now at the time this made some sense because everybody was operating with a Popmail account, so when you logged in, your email got downloaded to your machine. And so if there was email on somebody's server after 180 days, it was because you actively chose to store it there. So they were making a distinction that made sense and was the best political battle by they could get, but it doesn't make any sense today where all my email, right, remains stored in a cloud. So there's a, an effort that was just recently announced by um, a bunch of major companies and nonprofits um, and some academics to basically rewrite this law um, to update the privacy protections for electronic information. Um, and part of it spurred by location information, um, by cloud computing concerns. Um, so I think having some uh, better articulated, more consistent set of principles at the federal level would help put these conversations on a more even plane. Because right now we keep having, you know, it's uh, we keep having these little enclaves where we're like, whoa, that information is really sensitive. We better think about it, better rules for that, or it has to have its own network. Or, um, so having a higher federal floor would be one important step in unifying those conversations. Uh, Deirdre, some of the topics that you raised seem to involve a, um, issues that integrated across both regulatory uh, and technical implementation issues, such as this question about this home area network and, um, and um, uh, energy management systems and so forth. Um, but, um, and you know, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in, in smart mirror deployment, but my understanding was that, um, that at least in California, several utilities, notably PG&E, have already started deploying them and have a very aggressive schedule to deploy them by 2012. So um, what I'm wondering is, um, uh, I mean, isn't, in a certain sense, the cat out of the bag? I mean, isn't it this, to what extent can we still fiddle with uh, issues that involve technological adaptation, or is it just the case that there's already a user base and it's growing so rapidly that all we can do is put regulatory um, uh, infrastructure on top of it? Yeah, um, so I would say, while well, California, because it was a relatively early adopter, um, has uh, agreed, right, th there's already been kind of uh, commission proceedings that have okayed certain deployments, and in those deployments, the gate, the Han is actually in the meter, Ron will correct me, or Gaiman will correct me if I misstate any of this. Um, and so I think there are some areas where the cat is out of the bag. Um, if you look broadly across the country, no. I mean, at NIST and at FERC, the standards are still under development. Zigbee is on, I don't know, version 2.2 or it, it, it's still under development. And so I actually think that there still is an opportunity. And I think part of it is making sure that the conversation um, isn't just about doling out money, right? That the conversation has to be about requirements for these systems. And I think it's very important that the um, CPUC has started a conversation about what sort of requirements. And in part, um, I liken this to uh, voting technology, which you know I've had a fair amount of involvement in. And, and you know, there what we saw, we had a federal law that said, everybody needs new voting technology. Here's a bunch of money. Go buy stuff, right? Without doing a good job of articulating what requirements were, should guide um, and so what happened was we got a lock-in of 2002 technology, which because of the, the, um, both um, the standards and the testing of those machines were pretty crappy, right? They didn't meet a whole bunch of expectations, not just security, but they were also not useful if you're interested in kind of usability. There were no guidelines on usability when, when those machines got certified. Right, so we had the cart before the horse. People got money, they invested in technology before we had any requirements. And I think here, there is a substantial risk that we might be in a similar position. There's a lot of stimulus money. It's being given out. People are making investment decisions. And I think it's unclear. We don't want a smart grid, right? We want a grid that helps us manage energy better, right? And what are the requirements that need to inform the grid in order for us to get that result? And so I think it's not just, 
you know, privacy, yes, it's been left out of some of the conversations. But I think the general um, need to establish a set of requirements, what are the metrics by which we're going to evaluate? Did we succeed? Wow, we got lots of cool widgets. Woohoo! Right? And if the real result we want is better load control, fewer power plants being built, energy conservation, well, we need a different set of metrics. So you're saying it's too late for California, but the rest of the country might be safe. No, I mean, <laughs> no, no, not at all. I mean, California, the, there have been some things approved, but there is still, there's an ongoing process at the CPUC to look at these issues more broadly. It is not at all over in California at all. Uh, so, so automated. Oh. I just wanted to say it. it PG&E was actually very clever and very smart, and what they put into their meters to enable the HAN is flashable, meaning that it can change its uh, functionality. So right. I think PG&E has that. been very uh, uh, clever about this, and I think it isn't over in California. I think they have a set of requirements that they're moving towards today, and if uh, their customers and the state changes it slightly, I think they can adapt and do what's required. Uh, so. Automated data exchange is coming to Texas very soon, yeah. Ontario very soon, and depending on what happens at the CPUC, pretty soon in California. You mentioned FIP um, principles. Are those being considered, for instance, in Texas? And if so, how? And um, do you have a good example of an implementation of FIP? Because one of the common um, sort of refrains is that you know, usable privacy, that's what you want. You don't want to, noticing consent might be too little, but doing full out fit might be way too much and people might not understand what's going on. So what's the, the trade-off and how does it fit into these very soon to be launched exchanges? Well, one of the interesting things is that um, some of the core components of the fair information practice principles that have been under implemented and also, and where they have been implemented underutilized. So for example, the access right, are things that are kind of uniquely situated to advance energy management, right? Of course, if you're developing a system and what you want to do is prompt better decision making around energy consumption by consumers, you're going to want them to have access to their data, right? So in some ways, because this is focused on changing consumer behavior, I actually think we have a better shot at implementing some of the privacy provisions that have been most difficult to get buy-in because they're costly in some instances, such as the access rate, um, because it's so tied to the performance goals for the overall effort, right? So there's some sweet spots. Um, there are, so I'm not actually familiar with the Texas PUC rules, but I have looked at them before, and they are relatively similar to what we have today at the PUC. And I, right, so the, the PUC, the existing rules for investor-owned utilities, um, are a FIP sort of model, right? So we have a history of public utilities commissions using those sorts of fair information practice principles in this market. Um, the problem is that the market has changed in a way that makes some of those principles need updating or need expanding to cover new entrants. Um, it's not so much that they're like, woo, we've never seen these before. I, I, I'm curious, I, I didn't hear you mention uh, anything about, for example, the precautionary principle. And, and yeah. I think there's, there's a lot of empirical evidence that if data exists uh, and it's in the hands of people who may abuse it in different ways, inevitably it's going to happen at some point. And, and a lot of these uh, regulations are going to be rather difficult to, to track and enforce. And so I'm just wondering, from a legal perspective, how do people think about the fact that, I mean, you could have a law in the books, but it doesn't mean people's privacy won't be violated in practice. And in many cases, once the cat's out of the bag, it's hardly, uh, you know, that you can't make them whole again. And, and I mean, maybe, not, maybe energy is not as severe as some other cases. But uh, what do you think about just uh, the idea that, whoever has the information is likely to sort of uh, take it wherever they like at, at some level and, and therefore the goal is, is, in, is in some sense to make sure that it's, um, the, the flow is, is restricted. Yeah, well, so there are kind of three different parts of that problem. One, the precautionary principle, very big in Europe, not so big here in the US, you might know. Um, and so, you know, we have a, a much, um, a much more, limited view on regulation, right? Partic there have been some legislative changes to how agencies, for example, proceed with regulation that require them to kind of have more evidence before they act, right? Not to act in a precautionary way, but to make decisions to limit activities in the marketplace based on sound evidence. 
Um, so that's just a little kind of aside. Um, FIPS, one of the, the second principle that you saw up there was about data minimization, right? And that's both, you know, both collecting the little that, whatever the least is that you need, but also making sure that it only flows. If, if, you, if you're in computer science, you can think about kind of the principle of least privilege, right? That's what you want to operationalize. Um, and I think that there are nice opportunities because there is a commonality in kind of terminology in that area to think about minimization, think about aggregation, um, think about de-identification, even though we know you, you can't say it's de-identified against the world, but if you have kind of limited constrained ways in which the data flows and you have rules that say people can't try to recombine it with other data, right, you can actually um, have data that's robust enough to support activities, yet maintain the privacy of the actual data subjects. Uh, I have a comment. You used the word, there should be a conversation on these things, and I agree with that completely. But watching the conversations that are currently going on, it's sort of like one person with a bullhorn talking to someone who's mute. And I think that needs some basic changing. And which conversations are you referring to? Almost in anyone in this area. Okay. <laughs> um, so I will say, you know, I've participated somewhat in conversations that the PUC has begun. Um, and I have found those to be pretty open and inclusive. Um, and they invited me back, right? So I'm, you know, I, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not telling them the same old, same old, or telling them, oh, yeah, everything's fine, carry on. Um, so, you know, my experience in California has suggested that they're, they're actually trying to look at these issues and trying to make a good plan that gets us where we want to go. Um, at the federal level, I mean, everything's been on an incredibly expedited timeline. And I think that expedited timelines make it really hard for people to think broadly and thoughtfully. And so I think that, you know, that timeline has been a problem, and that's why I equate it to kind of the experience with voting machines. And I think, therefore, um, it's probably more important that folks like the Public Utility Commissions are forcing conversations up from the bottom, because a lot of the conversations at the federal level are about the technology. Uh, could you further comment about uh, uh, public uh, acceptance? You know, right now the conversation you are referring to seems to be either the federal or state level. Uh, what you are referring, when and how to approach the public, who, who are the one who really have to accept it or reject it, and I just want your comment along those lines a little bit. Um, yeah, so I don't know of any studies that show that, like for example, people didn't want to participate in the demand response. Um, uh, test because they had privacy concerns. Like, I don't know of any research that shows that. Um, there's certainly research that shows that people kind of feel most protective about information about the activities and the information and the relationships that are within the four walls of their home. Right? We know that. Um, there are other areas I can point to. I wouldn't, I'll point to this in a qualified way. Um, so, in the early 90s, I was involved in a whole series of conversations all across the country with different um, insurers and, and uh, uh, business owners and state health departments about the creation of community health management information systems. And they went relatively nowhere, right? And I think in part, it was because people had huge concerns about automating personal health information, both privacy and security concerns but also provenance, integrity, availability. Like there were a whole host of requirements that they just didn't feel like were going to be met, right? Um, and I would say if you look at the conversations today about networking health information, they're exactly where they were in 1992. I can't say that's all about privacy, but I think privacy has been one of the things that's made hospitals and others reluctant to automate information. I think that's one of the reasons there's been slowed adoption. So, you know, privacy is not going to tank the smart grid. I think that privacy can be built into the smart grid, and I think if it is, people will have less concerns about using it, and you'll see more adoption. But I can't give you any hard evidence. You know what question? Great, thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you.